Boom. Thank the internet gods that we have gone live. We're just a few minutes early this morning. I know it's early for so many of you. And for those who I tagged, <laughs> I uh, sorry you're going to see your tags come through uh, because some of you gave me crap uh, yesterday about not going on. Uh, Daniel, I appreciate that with your, um, uh, uh, I appreciate you jumping in and pointing and going, hey man, where you at? You said you were going online and uh, I loved your gift. For those who know me, you know I love really good gifts. Uh, that's not G-I-F-T-S, that's G-I-F-S. And in fact, while we're doing the show, please post your best gift. Uh, I love it. Uh, so today is Fun Thinking Friday and I'm super, 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 super pumped. You know, all week long, I'm wrestling with like, does Facebook talk to Zoom today? And uh, then I'm also wrestling with like, I got to come up with something smart and, and make sure that we're helping you grow smarter, grow more intelligent, help educate, encourage, and empower you. That's what uh, State of the Spark does. We ignite lives with explosive significance. And what that means is we educate, encourage, and empower you to accomplish your dream in bigger ways. Um, and uh, so all week long, I'm coming up with stuff. I love Friday. Because you're going into the weekend, and I try to keep it light, but I love talking about how the brain works. And we're going to talk about fun with thinking Friday, uh, because I feel like this. Of all the things that I could teach you, of all the things that Adam and Brittany and Marissa and the Spark Citizens could teach you, of all the things that Derek could teach you, the, some of the best things that we could teach you is how to think. I don't know if you realize this, but like whether it's... Uh, my journey has included a whole array of different skills and experiences and fun things. But the biggest things that my I take pride in, the biggest stories I have to tell, the biggest adventures I've been on have been adventures here. I would say that when I was involved in a non-denominational Pentecostal church, it expanded my horizons in so many ways. It matured me as an individual in so many ways. But one of the biggest things is how it cracked my brain like a walnut as to what was possible. And then you move forward and you leap forward to uh, the group I was with that was paying me to read books. The biggest thing that opened me to is all the other teachings, all the other sales skills, all the other experiences that cracked my brain open like a walnut. Semester at Sea, it opened my brain up to different ways of thinking. And what people don't realize is that when they're frustrated in their relationships, they're frustrated in their health, they're frustrated in their business. It's not because it, – it is in part because they haven't read the latest, greatest book. But really what that means is they haven't – they don't have enough mental tools. And I don't just mean thoughts borrowed from writers. I don't just mean ideas borrowed from the latest Instagram person. I mean something that is in your bone marrow deep, in gray matter deep, another tool you can pull from. So to that end, today is Fun Thinking Friday, and today we're going to be covering first principles thinking. You might think you've heard of this, but I don't know if you have entirely, so we're going to cover first principles thinking, and I'm going to have you two quick, really cool stories about first principles thinking. One happened this week with a coaching client, and, I, and I'd love when you guys can learn from coaching clients because coaching clients pay a good amount of money to, to get coaching, but I want to share it with you because you can learn so much from their experience. I don't know about you, but I learned peripherally from other people's experiences so well. We're also going to tell you a story about my first business and how uh, failure to think about first principles <laughs> caused us to fail pretty hard. And I'm going to share that with you. That's going to be a super fun story today. And then I'm going to give you a real-time example. By real-time, I mean yesterday afternoon at 4 p.m. real-time uh, example. So you can see how to apply this yourself. And then simply put, we're going to summarize it and show you in a post-virus world how you can apply first principles thinking, whether you're working in a nonprofit, which my heart and my passion is for the mission-driven individuals working in nonprofit organizations. I love it, but you can also be on mission in a for-profit business. So we're going to be covering how to apply first principles thinking in a post-virus world in your uh, business, mission-driven business as well. But first things first, as usual, I promise and I guarantee to deliver 
other news that has nothing to do with the coronavirus, or as we come out of the coronavirus, other news that has nothing to do with whatever the talking heads and shiny, beautiful people in Hollywood and in media are talking about. We're going to try to keep the trend of other news. And so whatever the, the, the message coming through mainstream media, whether it's the virus or something else that's just like drilling your brain and you're like, I'm so over this, whatever this is, we're going to continue the trend of doing other news on the Spark Show. So let's take a lovely sip of our early morning coffee. Know that we're going to have a fun show, but first, other news. Woo. So in other news, one, I was super excited to know the nerd in me, nerd alert, as Marissa always says, the nerd in me is super pumped to know that someone is still working on the Star Trek warp drive. <laughs> someone is still working at creating the warp drive hypothesized in Star Trek. Apparently, it's been around for about 30 years. Some researchers um, in Cardiff were originally working on it. And now at the University of, Hun of Alabama in Huntsville, which does have a powerful space program, an engineering program, they are still working on the warp drive. And I cannot tell you how excited I am. In short, this creates, uh, it's not about moving the spaceship or the person faster than the speed of light. It's about creating a bubble, a warp bubble of basically distorting space around a person and that actually moving through space faster than light. But the bubble itself, it's like standing inside of a train, long story short. So the, the mathematics apparently is still very valid. They've been working on the mathematics for a long time. Apparently that's still very valid, but they're still waiting on material science to catch up. So in short, we don't have the technology to build the technology. It's always fun, I find, I don't know if you guys know this, but here's a brilliant, ingenious thing for you to take away as a fun fact to your jobs or to your Zoom meetings or your remote work today, and that is this. Most every piece of technology for, starts first as a dream, then moves to the math stage and the hypothesis stage, and then moves to the materials science stage. Good morning, Miss Gina. I hope you're doing well this morning. Thanks for being patient with all of our technical things this week. Good to see you. That's Gina Bullock. She's been an awesome friend, acquaintance, and community driver. And by driver, I mean, what sort of car do you drive? Corvette. She's going to skewer me. She drives Corvettes. That's what it is. She has a Corvette tattoo. She loves Corvettes. So she's going to skewer me for not keeping that in my brain. But no, all good technological advances start first as a dream, usually over coffee or drinks or with friends, just bullshitting about something. Then comes the maths. And someone goes, man, that's possible. And they, they write out all the maths and they go, dang, the math shows it works. And then comes the material science. And material science actually comes along and puts that thing together. So I'm glad to know. And Gina would love to know this, that the Star Trek warp drive is still being worked on at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. In other, other news, and I'm geeked out about this. I am so geeked out about this. The universe, scientists are saying that the universe is actually a consciousness. and I, I, I see my friends, Ali Smith in the world, nodding, Derek Smith and Jill Smith nodding, going, yeah, that's right. We all knew it all along. We're all not in a simulation, but we're all part of something's imagination. Now, this is, again, only math and only theory. And they're using a theoretical constant known as phi. And phi is, an, is basically the measure of nodes. You don't have to know this, but it's just fun facts. You can talk about it later. Again, coffee table talk. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so the University of <coughs> the University of Munich, the center. <coughs> pardon me, choking on my own spit, getting excited. Nerd alert, Marissa says. <coughs> so the University of Munich, the mathematical philosophy department, came up with this constant called phi, and phi measures nodes. And nodes basically measure the complexity of intersections. And these intersections could have, <clears throat> could have everything to do with the brain. They could just have to do with computer science. They could do with a lot of things. But what they're finding is a way to apply the phi mathematics to the universe. <clears throat> and if you can apply the phi mathematics to the universe, you can actually see the complexity of the universe. And then they compare that to the complexity of the human brain versus the complexity of a computer. And from that, they can conclude that the most complex thing in the universe is the human brain. And if they can come up with the phi constant for the complexity of the universe, <clears throat> they can clearly show that the universe itself is a complex consciousness. 
So that's fun. That's coming out of the Munich Center of Mathematic Philosophy. Let me take a quick swig here. Excuse me, I'm verklempt. In art news, this is actually sadness. Sadness. In art news, art galleries are now hurting so bad from the stuff going on out there that they've been given permission to sell off artwork. Now, that's kind of sad. I'm very sad about that. Um, however, it is kind of creating a diaspora of art. To that point is my fourth and final other news regarding this. So art, is, so art galleries are hurting so bad that they're selling off art, but what happened? This is an interesting thing that happened. Damien Hirst is a famous artist. One of his paintings sold for $30,000 in New York. It sold to a group known as Mischief, M-S-C-H-F. They bought the painting and then desecration of all desecrations. They sliced this thing up. There was, so Damien Hirst's art is often like dots and they're different colored dots and things like that. It's avant-garde stuff. There's 88 dots on this one piece of art. They sliced out all 88 dots precisely. They cut them out very precisely, sold them off for $480 each, signed by the Mischief Group on the back. They sold out in under five minutes. Well, if you do your calculations, that only comes to about $12,000. But they then found an art buyer for the remaining white paper, the white canvas negative, the remaining white canvas negative sold for a whopping $172,000. $172,000. That's insane. So they took a $30,000 piece of art, desecrated it, and then it turned into $190,000, $184,000 art sale. So this is the diaspora that's going on. So it's a tragedy that museums are selling this off, but it is interesting to see how creatives are distributing this. And as a total bonus piece of other news, check out my guy, Jason Kofke, who's on a mission. He's been on a mission for over a decade or more with the message and his art installations called Everything Will Be Okay. Check out his Instagram profile. He's got awesome t-shirts on Everything Will Be Okay. Yes, love. Marissa's watching. She goes, what? Yes. Yes, that actually happened. Nerd alert. <clears throat> I love it when Marissa watches uh, because she's just so entertaining and I know what her expressions mean. So that's in other news. So yes, go ahead, check out my friend Jason Kofke. His Instagram is Kofke um, and look for everything will be okay. It's phenomenal. So let's move on to first principles thinking. So first principles thinking, as I promised, is a thinking tool to help you get through the bramble briar patch. Yes, I use the briar patch. And if you want me to try to incorporate, uh, we used to do this in sermons. Um, we used to challenge each other. How can we use a phrase like aluminum siding in my next sermon? And you get challenged. So I just used the word briar patch and it was such an odd word. It struck me and reminded me of the time that we used to do that. If you want me to throw a phrase in one of our talks and as a challenge to see if I can incorporate that phrase, I'd love to bring that challenge out. But in the briar patch of thinking, especially in times that we're in right now, there's so much data, so much input that we have a paralysis of decision making. I see this in small business. I see this in cause driven organizations. People have so much going on, they don't know what to think. And this is where first principles thinking comes about. <clears throat> Let me share a quick story. This week I had a coaching client come up and I love this person's thinking. They're always coming up with new ideas. And they reached out and they're like, hey man, <clears throat> I've got this idea and we're going to roll out this product offering and that product offering and I'm going to do this, this, and that. And then I was like, okay, that sounds great. That's interesting. I mean, that might work. And in this new market, as, as we reopen for business, we're going to do this, 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 and this. It's like, okay. I said, um, what, what then? Then we're going to market it. We're going to do this, this, or that. And then they expressed where they were getting stuck. Well, I'm stuck at this, 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 and this. And so we started breaking these points down together. And uh, come to find out, the reason they're thinking about all of these new avenues is that their business is hurting. I get it. And they're coming up with new avenues. I get it. But the reason they were stuck is they weren't sure how to market. And then as we broke it down further, they weren't sure how to produce it. And then as we broke it down further, they weren't even sure how to, how it gets produced. They were offering things they didn't know how to do. So I started asking them, Hey, listen, what are your core raw materials? And in short, they didn't have, it wasn't just like, Hey, this, this, 
entrepreneurs need to pull themselves up by their bootstrap and make up, make it up. They literally didn't have the raw material, the core principles to deliver the thing. And so I asked a simple question, well, what do we know? And they said, well, I just know I need to sell something. Well, what have you been selling before? And they described their, their product, their service, sorry. They described their service and it's a core service. And I said, well, why aren't you just selling that? And we sat back and thought about it and realized they're not just selling that because they thought that they had to invent something completely new. Let me parallel this. My first official business. My first official business was done with a friend, Ron Gerke. Sometimes he actually watches the show. He's in Sebastian, Florida. And though me and my friends had attempted a lot of startups, my first official business was a website design video production company. And he knew website design. I didn't know my head from my butt. I knew what computers were. Uh, but we said, ah, oh, we're going to do video production. And we took an American Express credit card that came in the mail and swiped it and racked up $10,000 in charges. This is when 2000, 2001, 2000, something like that. We racked up $10,000 of expenses for, for a fancy video camera, for software, for fat computers. We were set up. And then we're like, well, we've got no business. What do we do next? I don't know. People always talk about messaging and marketing and branding. And we had just read this killer book, Seizing Your Divine Moment. We're like, let's do this. And so we spent the next weeks and months working on a business name. What should we name it? Because when you name it, it's cool. And people get involved like Apple or Mac or any of these cool companies. So we spent forever, weeks and weeks and weeks thinking about the name of our company. And weeks later, we finally came up with it over a chess game. And the name of it was N. Passant Productions. N. Passant Productions. Do you know what that means? I had to figure out what it means. It was a fancy moving chess that you can only use once, and it's when a pawn can take any other piece, but they take it in a different way. It's a move that can actually change the game. And we're like, whoa, this is brilliant. This is so fancy. We were out of business in six months. Why was that? Because we didn't sell anything. We forgot first principles. We got caught up in the bramble briar patch of what is fancy and what is shiny and what we think the big boys are doing with these fancy companies. And we look at a fancy company and we project a lot about that fancy company. We project so much about them. Here's Apple. Here's Google. They start in a garage. Let's build an algorithm. But Let's think about first principles for a second. Do you know anything about building search algorithms? Do you know anything at all about this business, about web design, in our case, about video production? We didn't know anything about sales. We didn't know anything about management. We skipped first principles thinking, and as such, our business, we were out of business in very short order. Let's jump back to my coaching client friend. All these fancy ideas, which I don't disagree with. They're great ideas. All the opportunity going on right now. These are all new inputs hitting someone's brain, going all over the place. And they're going, maybe I shouldn't go out because of how people are judging others for going out right now. Maybe I should stop my business. Maybe I should go all online. People have these great testimonies of going online and their business blows up and it's fantastic and yay. Do you have anything to offer about going online? Is your business prone? If you have a landscaping business, yes. If this pandemic were to continue, I would advise that if you have a landscaping business to go online. Why? Because I know how to take you online. And it, when you're a hammer, you see everything as a nail and I can help you make money that way. But if you're not comfortable in front of the camera, first principles, are you comfortable in front of the camera? If you can't talk about your business, this week I have advised two or three people and they're like, I want to go online. And I'm like, great, I'm going to turn the camera on. Let's do this. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to talk about. And I'll say, we'll talk about your company. That, that was my response. Talk about your business. Talk about your nonprofit. Well, I don't, I don't know what to say. What do you mean you don't know what to say? If, hear me, total sidebar, pause first thinking principles and let's jump over here. Whether you have a mission-driven organization or whether you are a business, if I can't turn the camera on and you can't talk for the next 30 seconds to a minute and a half about what you do differently, you do not have a business. You don't have anything unique to offer. Now, you could have a lawn mowing company because I, I mow lawns and that's it. And that's great. That should last you the first three months while you're hustling uh, contracts. 
But after that, you should be able to go out on your own and say uniquely what we do differently. We show up early, we show up on time, we do this. We mow your lawn four days a week. I don't know what you do unique, but you need to be able to speak about what you do uniquely, you know? So jump back to this. First principles thinking says, do I have the raw material? And a first thinking principle is something that is not dependent on any assumptions. This person was thinking, assuming we stay in the pandemic, assuming, assuming people are going to judge me for being out and about, assuming that all of my income is going to tank. And to unwind this thinking, you go to, you know, first things first. You ever hear that phrase? Or let's go back to the basics. That's all first thinking principles is. Let's back up. Can you sell something? What are the raw materials you have to sell? What is relevant about that? And what are the facts? That's first thinking principles. So let me give you the quick definition. A first principle is a foundational proposition or assumption that stands alone. It stands on its own. Here's another quick example of how you can apply this today and how we benefited from applying this today. And that was this. <clears throat> Buying stocks. So in 2008, I learned first thinking principles of buy low, sell high. Let me jump back. My first stock investment ever, it took me six months of working overtime. I'm not exaggerating. It was 2000. I was working at um, Piper Aircraft, and I took all the overtime I could in Vero Beach, Florida, all the overtime I could to put, to put away my first. It was the biggest amount of money I had ever had in the bank ever. My first $1,600. It was the first time I'd ever put that much money away. And I put that money away and I was learning about trading options from my mentor, Terry. And I got my E-Trade account. I opened up, I got approval for trading options. Six months later, I was so proud. I bought a cup of coffee. Then I went down and I put my trade down and lost it in 30 minutes. <laughs> Man, I can laugh about that now. You know how dramatic that was for me? It took me six months to save my first $1,600, and I came from a poor background. That was a lot of money. I could have bought a car at that. In fact, I did. I bought my first car for $1,300, the green machine. This was my first Toyota Corolla. <laughs> and I lost it in 30 minutes because I bought high and sold low. First principles. I knew that I should buy low and sell high. I bought high and sold low. To jump forward to 2008, I watched the market. I knew exactly where I would have purchased. I just didn't have the cash. So I did my paper trading, which is when you earmark what my action would have been for how much, and then you wait, and then, it sell, and then you find your point you're going to sell. And I could have made a ton of money, but I had no cash. No cash whatsoever. So I committed that the next time the market would tank, I'd have several thousands of dollars put aside. My goal was to have 10 grand put aside. In this market correction, we watched the market tank in under a month. Marissa and I were sitting on the side, just watching it tank, watching it tank. And we said, it's now the time. And now all the emotions are happening. All the news is coming. The bramble briar patch of other thoughts come flinging at you. And that bramble briar patch was making me doubt. Is this the right decision? Is this the right time? What should I do? I watch the market all the time. I know for certain that this is low. And I know for certain I have the cash. One and one equals two, right? No, all the emotions. Well, we're going to stay closed till, till 2021. And we're going to cancel the Olympics. And we're, gonna, we're going to hate on anybody who's saying anything else. And it's all insane. And then like, well, what if I do trade? And what if I do make money? What are people going to think? What if I do trade and lose all my money? All of the crazy. And then you stop and go. What are core principles? Buy low, sell high, have cash. So we did. I think our, uh, as of yesterday morning, I think our trading account is up 91%. I've said this before in the show. I don't say that to impress you. I say that to impress upon you. When you get to core principles, when you return to core principles, life opens up. It creates another topic we'll talk about some other time called optionality. It gives you options. Now, we're also looking at property. I mean, is does it feel like the right time to look for property? Well, mortgage rates say yes, but fear and anxiety and the bramble briar patch out there says, no, you should be completely afraid of anything that moves, lives, or breathes, and no one knows what's going to happen next. Woohoo, yeah. Thanks, Carrie. I appreciate your, your, uh, your encouragement there, definitely. What made you go, woohoo? Maybe it was the stock market. I don't know. 
uh, cause there's a delay on Facebook. So, um, <clears throat> So we're looking at the real estate market right now because first principles, buy low, sell high. Does it cash flow and do you have cash? If it doesn't cash flow, it's a non-option. But Marissa and I also have all the Bramble Briar Patch. We would love to have a part-time home at the beach. We'd love to make money uh, in Cocoa. We'd love to do this. We'd love to do that. Oh, and the market's crazy. And like, what message does it send if we're buying investments? What do people closest to us think? Ah, stop. What are core principles? So how can you apply this in a, post, uh, uh, in a post virus or virus, not even post virus, in this crazy world of virus, how can you apply first principles thinking? Whether you're in your mission-driven organization, whether that's for-profit or non-profit, whether you're a missionary in Haiti or the Dominican Republic, or whether you're a small business owner here, how can you apply first principle thinking? 91% growth, yes, that is what I'm talking about, Carrie. Like, the we are blown away we feel super blessed in that we're not geniuses well maybe marissa's a genius but we came up with a system and we bought a, an array of stocks and um and we've also been spending the last 10 or 15 years watching the market so we kind of knew what we wanted to look at it uh and so we had a long time to plan i guess is what i'm saying so how can you apply first principles thinking in a virus world <clears throat> first off if you can carve out the time, turn off social media, turn off video, retreat into your room and, and ask yourself a core first principle thought. What's my goal? It's probably about your business. It's probably about your mission-driven organization. It's probably about your work or your efforts. What's my goal? Remind yourself of the goal. I could turn my camera around and show you we've got major goals on the wall and we need to update them. They're actually outdated, but this has been a guiding principle for us. And, and if you ever see me, you're talking here, I'm looking at my screen to see how I look. I'm looking at Facebook to see what people are saying. I'm looking at you, the people. I'm glancing over here and then I'm also glancing up here to see my goals. Return to your first principle. What is my goal? And for most of you, it's keeping your business going. And then you got to ask yourself, what raw materials do I have to work with? If I have a landscaping company, okay, how do I take that online? Question is, do I need to take that online? Well, back up. That's, that's, that assumes a lot. That question assumes a lot. What is that question assuming? That question is assuming, well, all this stuff. It, like, we don't even realize we're assuming. When we say, well, it, when we second guess ourselves, think about this. Think about this. When we second guess ourselves, we have inserted assumptions. I have a landscaping company, for example. Should I actually go out and sell? Wait, pause. What are your assumptions? Why are you asking that question? The question you should normally ask when you have a business like a landscaping company is, should I out be out selling? <laughs> yeah, I have something to offer. It is something people need, especially in the state of Florida when it's been raining. They need it. I should sell it. First principle thinking. When it came to our nonprofit work, I've seen this a lot in nonprofits. And if you have a cause or if you involved as a volunteer in a cause, help them think through first principles thinking. And here's why. When we think about our work in Haiti, when I thought used to think about our work in Haiti, you have so much bramble briar patch going on in your brain, right? Well, what about the oppressive government? What about uh, tourists getting killed or raped or, or macheted? What about the dynamics of being afraid of being the great white hope? I, have a, I am petrified of being the great white hope when it comes to our missionary work or, or our development work. I don't want to be guilty of being the ugly American where I know because I'm white and I come from the West what's good for you. And so that's going on in your brain and you're like, shit, like I don't, I don't know how to serve you. And so paralysis comes and then you don't do anything. First principles thinking. Why am I thinking about Haitians at all? There's someone. I value people. I value potential in people. They need. I have something that meets that need. All these books that threaten you and say, beware of being the great white hope. It's a worthy warning. It's a worthy warning. However, don't let it paralyze you from sending freaking rice or sending clothes. Now, we are convicted, like I stopped making those trips because these trips, sending a white person to, in this case, Haiti, is a very expensive proposition. And 
it, what it takes for you to be there for a week, you could fund their life for an entire year. So first principles thinking, they have a need, I have something they need. Maybe that's my presence, very rarely. Patients know how to work, they know how to sweat, they know how to get it done. What they often need is your money, not because they're needy, 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 but because they can do more with cash in a year than you could do it in a week. Or food. They often don't need clothes. If, like we had to go and discover first principles. We thought we would go bring dresses. They don't need dresses. We brought tons of shoes. You'd show up a week later. We'd go show up, distribute shoes, come back to the States, pick up another shoe drop, come back and do a shoe drop, and they had sold all the shoes. They don't need the freaking shoes. First principles, first principles would say, I'm not going to assume what you need. Let me ask, what do you need? So that's often how I think you could actually help nonprofits, help them think through first principles. And just by asking, what are we assuming? That is actually the number one question. What are we assuming with this? And when you look at what you're assuming, you need to actually ask yourself, are these valid assumptions or are they based on fear? Are they based on concerns? Are they based on things that are no longer relevant? When Florida opens up for business, some things will be relevant. Making sure that we're not coughing on people will be relevant. Making sure that we're social distancing where necessary, but other things will not be relevant. Other businesses just need to get back to the new normal because they need to say, if I have landscaping, for example, I don't need to think about all these fancy things. I need to actually just go sell. I need to just go sell. Don't let yourself off the hook with your fears, your assumptions, your concerns, your procrastinations. Sometimes... Yes, Marissa says, let me ask what you need. In fact, we had, and Marissa just jumped on and asked that question. Let me ask what you need. Absolutely, that applies to the, to the ministry field. It applies to the, the humanitarian field, but it also applies to your business. Yesterday, Brandon jumped on and Brandon said, hey guys, or Jenna and Brandon, I'm sorry, I, let me correct myself. Jenna Neal of Jenna Nicole Photography works with us part-time. She is phenomenal. Her husband owns Sabu Ramen, fantastic ramen place. Check it out. Jenna Neal brought up, why don't we just ask clients what they need right now? And we're like, duh, we should do a client survey. Brandon chimed in and said, yeah, I think we should really do this focus group thing. And together, Brandon and Jenna put together a good synopsis of what we should be doing to ask. Just because you're on a mission or working for profit does not matter. I've always said this, nonprofits are often the least efficient businesses I know. That doesn't mean they're bad. It just means they can improve in ways, right? Same principles though. First principles thinking. We're often overthinking it and we're not getting back to first principles. I think you get it. I'm not going to beat this dead horse. I love you guys. I really appreciate you for coming in. Remember, go out there today. Make it an awesome Friday, but remember the overall mission. Igniting lives of explosive significance, starting with your own. Let me know how you're igniting your life today. I'd love to hear in the comments or a follow-up or a message or email me or whatever. You can find us at stateofthespark.com. If you need help with Corona Recovery, go to stateofthespark.com forward slash Corona hyphen recovery or join our Facebook group, Goals and Gratitude and Small Business. We just had some Icelanders visit us and, and join our group. It's fantastic. The word is getting out that we're trying to support one another to grow our dream, to grow our mission. But remember, please remember, this is all about this life, your mission-driven organization, these conversations, you reading books, you getting fit, you doing your own to to total life experience. Remember what that's all about. Living a more exciting life, igniting your life and feeling inspired, and then hoping you can take that as a little sparkler and ignite someone else's. Have a great Friday. We love you guys. Thanks for stopping by. Stop by, keep checking us back, share the love, share this video with somebody else and start igniting lives today. Have a great one.